Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Iswan Qureshi and today I'm going to talk about a very interesting case, a case about hypotensive resuscitation. Unfortunately, most of the patients that we find interesting as emergency physicians are really quite sick. But how good the patient is really doing afterwards is the real deal. I recently saw a 41-year-old gentleman who presented just after a midnight handover uh, with abdominal pain and there's some information about hematomesis and melina, possibly in the last couple of hours. The patient was severely distressed due to abdominal pain and he was also confused and shaking because of being very cold. Is unable to give us any reasonable amount of information. All we knew that he had a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease and hemochromatosis. His presenting blood pressure was 60 by 50, heart rate of 105 and saturation of 92% on room air. His blood sugar was 7 and temperature of 34. So yes, he was quite profoundly hypothermic as well. The patient was in our resuscitation area. Uh, the registrar called us that he's got a very sick looking patient and we must come to the recess room. I would like you to pause the video here and think about the differential and what management would you do? As I moved into the recent room, the thoughts which were going through the mind were, could he have an ulcer rupture, given the fact that he has got esophageal reflux history? Uh, could it be bleeding uh, because he's constantly vomiting and dry retching? Could it be a cold sepsis from an unknown infection? So we gave the patient a liter of fluid, we gave the patient proton pump inhibitors, antibiotics suspecting some cold sepsis, one of the most remarkable thing that I still remember about the patient that he looked purple, he looked distressed and there was some dried blood over his lips. His blood pressure was 60 by 50 and heart rate of 105 and he had a weak carotid pulse. The chest was normal but I was unable to hear his heart sound. His abdomen was like a bored rigid abdomen. The kind of abdomen that you get in peritonitic examination and surgical bellies. Her rectal examination however did not show any melina. Uh, massive transfusion protocol was activated and he was given two units of uncross matched blood. Further cross matched blood was coming, so the patient was in the meantime started on fluids and also started on noradrenaline infusion because his blood pressure was 60 systolic after two units of uncross matched blood transfusion. His first VBG showed a pH of 7.2, PCO2 of 34, bicarbonate of 20, and lactate of 10. And the hemoglobin, which we missed at that point, not looking or focusing on to, was 146. His ECG shows sent psychicardia. The blood pressure now after the noradrenal infusion was 80 by 60. The heart rate still going at rate of 107. And the maps were hovering around 67 to 70 millimeter mercury. He obviously had this narrow pulse pressure. Pause the video and think, what differential diagnosis are you thinking? Now, at this stage, we were thinking, could he have mesenteric ischemia? Could he have ruptured gastric or you know, ruptured duodenal ulcer, given the fact that he had a severely tender surgical belly? However, his bedside EFAST did not show any fluid fluid in the abdomen. Uh, but when we looked at the pericardium, it showed pericardial effusion. That moment we realized that we're not dealing with hypovolemic shock, but actually an obstructive shock. Um, the cardiology were immediately called for pericardiocentesis, but they said they're about 30 minutes away. But just why is this very healthy, well, 41-year-old patient got pericardial tamponade all of a sudden? Like his history is only two or three hours old. It just does not make sense. Uh, he should have at least have some chest pain for at least a couple of days, some flu symptoms of being unwell or fever. None of that. It looks like that he is going to arrest any moment. And at that moment, we thought, okay, so we've got a hypotensive and tachycardic patient who's also hypothermic. Um, could it be something else? Now, pause the video here and think about what could else be going on with this patient. That's right. We were also thinking about aortic dissection with pericardial blood and tamponade coming from it. But the other differential, could it be a massive pulmonary embolism with obstructive shock? Or could it still be a bowel perforation or some sort of retroperitoneal hemorrhage? We were not just sure at this stage. So we decided to take this patient to, you know, CT scan to establish the diagnosis. The problem was that if we keep the patient waiting in emergency recess room, he will arrest and we would not be able to help him with anything. 
Also, if it's not an aortic dissection, which we are suspecting at this stage, uh, then what is it? And if it's an aortic dissection, he will need a completely different specialty who are not here right now. He would need a cardiothoracic input. He need a vascular input. And, you know, it is just one of those things which you need to establish. You can't just take this hypotensive patient to theater to open up his belly only to realize that it's a type A dissection. And what if it's not a dissection? So we were still puzzled and arming and ahhing whether we should take this patient to CT scan or not. Anyway, I decided to take this patient to the CT scan with a blood pressure of 70. Yes, the blood pressure of 70 systolic on running adrenaline rate of 12 mils an hour. But when I was taking them, I had all the contingencies planned. I had uh, the airway trolley. I had the resuscitation trolley with me. Um, we also had the additional doses of adrenaline, metoraminol, IV fluids, bloods. I had two emergency nurses, an emergency registrar, and even an ICU registrar accompanied me. We did the scan uh, with a blood pressure of about 70 or between 70 and 80 systolic. A huge risk, I know, that we took, but the benefit was to get the diagnosis, which is crucial for saving the life of this poor fella. The CT scan was done, and as soon as the contrast flowed, it showed type A dissection with pericardial tamponade. Obviously, it was hemopericardium, which was causing the pericardial tamponade. So the final diagnosis is type A aortic dissection causing pericardial tamponade due to hemopericardium. Now, I call my fellow consultant from the CT scanner that to call the cardiothoracics and the vascular surgeon because this patient needs to go urgently to emergency operation theater. Uh, and I said to him, we're going to tolerate a blood pressure of 70 systolic. Clearly, I know that these numbers are not looking favorable, but any intervention in terms of tapping off the pericardial effusion he would need sedation and that may compromise his very delicate hemodynamic status. So we're not going to intervene unless and until it is absolutely important to intervene, like in a peri-arrest or arrest situation. And we had, by that time, a cardiology registrar there as well at the bedside of the patient. So what were my learnings? Quite a lot, actually. Now, if you look at the protocols, when you get a hypotensive patient in the resuscitation room and... Uh, you know, you're suspecting a bleed. Most of the protocols would say to take the patient to operation theater. And that's absolutely true for most cases. But what if you have a management or a diagnostic dilemma in which the management is dependent on a crucial diagnosis? Then we must take a calculated risk. As described, you know, this patient, we either were going to take him directly to the theater and if, you know, he had a rigid belly and we were suspecting an acute abdomen, he would have gone to a general surgical theater only to find out that, you know, he has got nothing wrong with his belly and he may have even arrested with the induction of anesthesia given his narrow pulse pressure and very, very uh, sensitive hemodynamic status. So we needed to establish that diagnosis. The point I'm trying to get across is that, yes, most patients would need to go to theater with low blood pressure if you've got established diagnosis, but if the diagnosis is not certain, you may have to either take the patient to theater with all the contingencies in place that you would need vascular, cardiothoracics, and surgical. In an ideal world, it might not be possible. Or you take the patient to the CT scanner with all the preparation in place that if the patient was to deteriorate, at least I've got every measure in place if things don't go as planned. Now, with aortic dissection, most of the patients are in their 40s and 50s. And, you know, the textbook description of aortic dissection, the patient would be hypertensive and the tachycardic. In fact, one of the fellowship question is how to control the hypertension and tachycardia related to aortic dissection. But here we see a very rare complication of type A aortic dissection in which the patient is actually hypotensive. And that's because of his obstructive shock with all that blood sitting in the pericardium. The other thing was that the patient was constantly retching and wanted to vomit and open his bowels. Uh, I think that might have been because of his pain and vagal stimulation from the pain. Uh, and I think because when I was doing an anesthetic term as a registrar, I remember that, you know, lots of pregnant women used to get spinal anesthesia before the cesarean section and their blood pressure would suddenly drop. 
and they would start complaining of nausea and you know they would want to vomit and the anesthetist would give me give them the patient the pregnant patient at that time a small dose of metoramanol that would control the blood pressure and boom the nausea would go so i think i now can explain his consistent desire to vomit it might be the same thing because of pain now one of the other profound thing that i noticed about this patient was his color his color was purple and that's most likely to the cerebral venous congestion and remember his heart was all surrounded by the blood so all of the blood pooling from the head was unable to empty into the heart because of pericardial tamponade and he also had a very rigid belly and that might be because of hepatic congestion uh, that all of the blood carried through the ivc carried through the hepatic you know vein into the inferior vena cava into the heart was just not able to empty into his right ventricle because his right ventricle was just not able to take it anymore it was compressed externally by that huge pericardial tamponade the pericardial fluid which was blood in this case the other important learning in this case was under stress we tend to overlook things which are obvious now obviously this patient came in with this low blood pressure there was a little bit of blood on his uh, lips as well and even though we did a vbg but we you know forgot to check the hemoglobin on the vbg which was 147 which for this patient based on his previous record was stable number and when i did pick it up that's the moment when all the diagnosis or you know the resuscitation workup completely changed the scenario we were pumping blood into this patient which he clearly did not need uh, he had plenty of blood in his circulation it was just pooled at the wrong spot giving him pericardial tamponade in this case as you can see that it's important to have this certain master of inactivity tolerating all blood pressure low hemodynamic status instability in order not to further compromise his condition now his wife later told us that the patient had been complaining of chest pain for the last two days so i think he might have been dissecting even minimally for the last two days and to intervene now uh, would have been you know devastating uh, we were able to tolerate a low blood pressure the cardio uh, logist were there and eventually after establishing the diagnosis the cardiothoracic and the vascular also came down also the other thing which i noticed is that this patient arrived at midnight and that's the a time when we hand over to the night team and leave um obviously the consultant leave but my fellow consultant i felt bad that if i leave this patient um or if i leave the department or my fellow consultant with the patient who has got a 50 systolic blood pressure you know it's just not very ethical even though i'm not expected but i just felt bad leaving him alone and later he you know acknowledged that i stayed back and we were able to work through the diagnosis and help this patient Last thing I'd like to say I was surprised to see the patient's wife courage and support she remained calm as I was breaking the diagnosis to her in fact initially we had no diagnosis and then later we established the diagnosis which was quite life threatening and I told her and she remained completely calm she remained at the bedside of the patient telling the patient everything is going to be fine she kept on you know uh, raising his uh, uh, morale talked about their children and everything good in their life the final outcome about this patient the vascular and cardiothoracic team took the patient to ot from emergency department where he underwent the repair of his aortic dissection and a pericardial vento afterwards he was shifted in stable condition to icu i hope you like this case if you have got any points or any suggestion how would you have managed this case differently or anything that you would like to say or point out please share your thoughts with me in the comment section thank you very much